say amen. 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 It's, it's good to be with, uh, with you all this morning in the house of the Lord. A little hot. Turn me down just a little bit, bro. Um, down the other way. There you go. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. So it's good to see everybody this morning in the house of the Lord. Um, you know, we made it through another, another work week, uh, another uh, uh, chance to deal with coworkers who we don't like, uh, another chance to deal with children that, well, children that we love. And, uh, you know, God has blessed us to be here this morning to worship him in spirit and in truth. I want to welcome all of you all to the Edgewood Church of Christ where Brother John Wilkie is the minister. Uh, he and his wife are on vacation as the brother just stated earlier, I um, want to keep them in prayer that they would enjoy their vacation, that he would come back well rested and ready to be on fire for the Lord. Um, I know he's down there getting a lot of exercise. For you all that don't know, Brother Wilkie likes to cut up. Uh, uh, I mean, that means dance, if y'all didn't know that. Brother Wilkie likes to, likes to dance, and I know he was doing some dancing because I saw a Facebook Live post, and, uh, and he was behind the camera, but the camera was swaying like this, so... <laughs> So I, I figured he was he cutting the rug like he does, but, uh, you know, with, uh, yeah, yeah, I'll make sure I put that on, keep that on tape right there. So I want to appreciate him and his wife. I uh, pray that they're safe. Um, also want to uh, uh, say a special prayer for Brother Corey Williams. Uh, Brother Williams preached to us last week. And for those of you all who know Brother Williams, know something about him. Brother Williams is a hard-fighting soldier. Um, he's been through a lot of things in his life, um, but he is a true living testament that with God on your side, you can do anything. Amen. I want to thank him. I continue to pray for him and his family as well. And I'd also like to recognize some members of the audience who are my family. Uh, I see my mom, my mother-in-law, uh, grandma. Uh, I see aunt, uh, granddad. Um, I see a lot of people in the audience who came to uh, uh, hear the gospel of Christ. You know, it's good that they came to see me, but more importantly, I'm glad they came to hear God's word uh, this morning. So I want to... Uh, Thank them for being here. I also want to thank uh, my wife. Um, I recognize her all the time as my best friend. Um, she does a lot for the family. Um, she is one of the things and one of the reasons that, that I stay grounded or try to stay grounded in the Lord because I know I have a responsibility for a, a wife and children. And if I don't do what I'm supposed to do, I'm going to have to see her. So uh, I'm thankful for her and I appreciate her. And she's holding our, our brand new daughter. I still got to get used to saying that coming off my tongue, our brand new daughter. You know, we have, God has blessed us with four boys and uh, just saw fit this time to change his plan and, and give us a girl. I still don't know how we got ourselves into that, but that's another story. Um, so I just want to uh, say thank you to my wife, thank you to my children, and glad to see uh, uh, our daughter here. Keep her in prayer um, as well. Um, she, she's a newborn and she has um, some health concerns, but just keep that in prayer that, you know, God will, will see us through that as well. Amen. Uh, so without further ado, um, let us turn to the scripture that was read in Joshua chapter number 2. Joshua chapter number 2, verses 8 through 11. And this text here, it's, it's, a, common known, it's a commonly known text. Um, you know, the text that we really want to focus on is verses 1 through 11, but uh, for the sake of emphasis, we're going to read verses 8 through 11. And God said, let that be light. Amen. I appreciate that, my brother. So Joshua chapter 2, uh, beginning at verse number 8. And the Bible reads, who has their Bible? This is a little Bible check. Amen. We don't, we, churches don't do that too much more anymore. Do they? Bible check. Who brought their Bible this morning? Amen. Amen. So we, we, we pushing about 70%. We got to work on that church. We got to work on that church because I need, to, I need you all to make sure that what I'm saying is the truth. Amen. Amen. So we bring our Bibles to worship. Amen. So Joshua chapter 2, uh, beginning at verse number 8, and the Bible reads, and we're reading from the New Living Translation. Before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk to them. I know the Lord has given you the land, this land, she told them. I know the Lord has given you this land. Let's read verse number 9 again. I know the Lord has given you this land, she told them. We're all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror. For we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know what you did to Sion and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you completely destroyed. 
No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth below. I want to talk to you this morning from the subject a reputation of repetition and relationship. A reputation of repetition and relationship. You say that three times over, you get tongue twisted. A reputation of repetition and relationship. See, this is a commonly known text uh, about Israel as they were progressing um, through the wilderness and on to the promised land. But before we really get into the text, what I want to do is I want to put some, some groundwork down about why we have this topic, this subject, a reputation of repetition and relationship. You see, we're, we're living in a day and age where technology is at the tip of our fingers, right? Technology today is even different from when it was when I was a child, and that was 30 plus years ago. So in the year 2019, it is extremely easy for a person to project a representation of yourself that you want other people to see. There's a big void or a big gap between sometimes what your reality is and what the reputation that you want people to see you have. There's a big difference between the two. So it's extremely easy to create an image of yourself that you want other people to see. And let me, let me give you an example of what I'm talking about. So me and my wife, we homeschool our children. Thank God we'll be able to do that. We homeschool our children, and, and many times what we like to do for encouragement is we want to follow other people who homeschool their children, right? So we look at blogs, and we look at videos of people talking about how their day was. And many times we come across uh, pictures and videos where we see people's homes completely spotless <laughs> while they're sitting home with four or five kids. You know, so we're looking at this, trying to get encouraged, saying, my goodness, we are failing because <laughs> our house is upside down. And they take these pictures and these videos, and, and, and see, what they're doing is they're projecting uh, an image of themselves they, they want you to see, right? So what they'll do is they'll clean off the, the table, right? And they'll take a picture of the corner of the table. And that corner is completely immaculate. It's spotless. But if they were to just take that camera and pan to the left or pan to the right, you would see all this garbage all over the place. And see, what, what they do sometimes is they'll tell you in their blog that, hey, you know, this is what I did in order to show you, right, a picture that we want to see. But that goes to show you that every time you see something, an image of someone doesn't necessarily mean that that is who they are. Right. That is a reflection that they want you to see. Right. You see, just recently, there was an individual who was in the news, right, who was from Randallstown, and he wanted to show everybody that he was a rapper, right? He was this big time entertainment. Some of you all might have heard that on the news. And he, yeah, Randallstown, Randallstown, but that... that it, that's just that individual. I'm not talking about Randallstown because I live in Randallstown, so I'm not talking about Randallstown. But that individual, he, he took and spent about $4 million of his employer's money. He stole all that money just so that he can be in videos flaunting, showing money, showing cars, projecting an image of something that he wanted other people to see versus being who he really was. And you better believe the law caught up to him, and he's paying the price for trying to fake and for trying to stunt. You see, I know two philosophers by the name of Offset and Cardi B. Y'all heard of them before? <laughs> and, and, and they said, people do anything for what? Clout. It's clout. Come on, see, I see, I see I got a dated audience. Come on, come on, young people. <laughs> they said, they said, they, they do anything for clout, right? They try to project an image or show something of, of, of who they, who they want to be versus who they really are. You see, and a lot of times people get caught up doing that nowadays because we live in an environment that's so disingenuous that it's almost approved to be something that you're not, to show an image of what you're not. You see, people want the reward without the work, right? They want the reputation without the repetition. You see, they want to be known as something without doing the consistent action it takes to be known as that thing. You see, true, re true, uh, true reputation is not something that's bought. True reputation is something that is built. True reputation is not something that is bought, but it is something that is built. And you see, you build reputation by two things. 
repetition, and relationship. Being consistent and being connected. You see, that's a struggle to a lot of people, and it was a struggle to me coming up because sometimes I used to struggle with wondering if I was good enough, right? Wondering if, you know, I, I would try to go talk to a girl, and a girl like, man, I don't want to talk to you, man. You all, you all dark skin and et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, that's obviously that's, that's, that's on them, right? There's nothing wrong with, nothing wrong with uh, you know, dark skin handsome brothers, you know what I mean? So, but I used to struggle sometimes with wondering if I was enough. Right? Struggled with, with wondering if I could do um, everything that I wanted people to think I could do. But you see, my ministry now should not be built on trying to get people to think of me a certain way or trying to convince them that I got it all together. You see, my ministry needs to be built on establishing a reputation that's built on repetition and relationship. You see, I can't focus just on the superficial. I got to focus on the stuff, the substantive as well. You see, when a brother comes to me and says, listen, you know, I'm struggling with something. You know, the superficial would be just to pray for him. And that's a good thing. We're supposed to do that. But I got to jump in there, ask him what his problem is, and help him meet his need. I got to do some substantive things. I got to get underneath just what I want people to think I am and to actually start establishing relationships and being repetitive with the things that I do. You see, my children, they know that I love them, not just because of the stuff that I give them, but because of the sacrifices that I make. That's how you know a person loves you. You see, the, your wife will love you not just based upon the things that you can give her, but the time that you spend with her. Amen. Let the church say amen to that. Amen. amen. I, I was looking for a clap from India, but I didn't see it. But we're we going to get there soon enough. But you see, repetition in relationship is something that has to be built on time after time after time. And that's the same thing in the same way that God builds his reputation with us. You see, God doesn't just do the superficial things. He does the substantive, substantive things as well. You see, God doesn't just bless us with food. He blesses us with forgiveness. All right? He doesn't just give us the tangible things. He gives us the intangible things. And he does that time after time after time. God doesn't just give us money. He gives us mercy time after time after time. He doesn't just give us goods. He gives us grace time after time after time. I don't know about you, but I serve a time after time after time type of God. That is what God does for us. He doesn't just do the superficial, but he does the substance of things as well. So reputation is built on rep, uh, rep, repetitiveness, and it's also built on relationship. So that's how God does. God does those things. And, and that type of talk is just not prevalent today. You don't hear people talking about, I don't want to be superficial. Right? You, you hear, all you hear is superficial. I got money. I got this. I got that. But when the cameras go off, I get in my 91 Corolla and drive back to my mother's basement. That, that's, that's the reality. That's, that's always there sometimes. But you see people pushing the superficial and not the substantive because that is not prevalent today. See, it's, it's really hard to get a good name. But it's even easier to lose one. You see, God's name is good. And God's name is good because I know my relationship with him is because he comes over in uh, repetition. He, he does things over and over and over and blesses me over and over and over. And that's how my relationship is established with him. So his reputation with me is good. You ever walk down, down your neighborhood and you hear somebody say, oh, you know, such and such said that. Well, his name is good in the hood. So I know when he says something, it's, he, he's, a, he's about that action, right? He, he's good. You know, when, when you say, you know what, I, I, I bet you back in the day in school, we used to say, you know what, I put that on my mom, right? right. right? Because your, your mom means something. Right. You don't ever hear anybody say, you know what, let's bet. I put that on a trash can. <laughs> because a trash can doesn't mean anything. Yeah. But when your name is good, it means something. Yeah. And because right. God has a reputation, his name is good, and it means something. Amen? Amen. See, as easy as it is, I'm sorry, as hard as it is to get a good name, it's even easier to lose one. Right. And let me explain what I mean. We've been talking about uh, social media and things like that. Say, for instance, you know, I go online and I put something out there just being impulsive, and it was out there. When you put something out there on Twitter, Facebook, you can try to delete it, but it's out there. All it takes is 280 characters to tarnish something that took years to build. You see, you represent yourself, not only yourself, but you also represent other people, and you represent God. 
You know, when I send my kids out the house, I tell them, like, listen, your name is so-and-so Bennett. That Bennett means something because it's attached to me. <laughs> so when you go outside, you better do what you're supposed to do because it's going to get back to me that you didn't do what you're supposed to do, and it's not going to make your mom and your dad look good. So what you need to do is you need to make sure that you're doing everything you can do to keep not only your good name, but God's good name. Because God is attached to you. God allows you to be in his family. You see, and, and God, what God does, it's amazing. I'm not really sure why he keeps doing this, but he trusts his good name to bad people. God being perfect and being all-knowing and being all-powerful, the perfect God entrust his name to imperfect people. And those imperfect people are myself, everybody in this audience, everybody who's in the church, individuals who say I'm a follower of God. He says, you know what? I give you that. But you carry my name as well. So you make sure that when you go out, you represent. So my name is attached to God's name, and his reputation is attached to my reputation. Do you all understand that? So, so this takes us to our text. I said all of that to bring us back to our text. So, so this, this takes us to our text. A reputation of repetition and relationship. We're in Joshua chapter number two. And just to give you a little bit of background, Joshua chapter one, Joshua takes over for Moses. Moses was the man who led Israel through the wilderness. Joshua takes over, second-hand man to Moses. He takes over from Moses. God tells Joshua, you know what, every place you put your foot on, I'm going to give you that land. You know, God has a habit of making sure when he says statements, it's definitive. So you don't have to question it. He said, every land that you step on, I'm going to give it to you. So gather everyone up. Let them know that you're getting ready to go in and you're getting ready to take the land. So he gathered up the tribes and said, listen, I'm going to pick two people to go and send them into Jericho. Let's go by the land. Let's go ahead and take a look at Joshua chapter 2, verse number 1. The Bible says, Then Joshua secretly sent out two spies, and I have two spies highlighted for a reason. He sent out two spies from the Israelite camp at Acacia Grove. He instructed them, scout out the land on the other side of the Jordan River, especially around Jericho. So the two men set out and came to the house of a prostitute named Rahab and stayed there that night. See, Joshua sent out two spies when, if you think about it, just 40 years prior, they had the opportunity to take this land in Canaan. And Moses has sent out 12 spies. Think about that. Moses sent out 12 spies, and this time Joshua sent out two spies. Well, you might say, Brother Bennett, why he only sent out two? Well, because he probably learned his lesson from the last time the 12 went, because they should have had this land 40 years ago. But when they sent in the 12 spies, 10 came back with a bad report, and two came back with a good report. Two said, you know what, God, you're giving us this land. We can take this land. 10 said, you know what, there's giants in this land. They're inhabitants of the land. They're going to take everybody who tries to take their land. And guess what? The people believed what the 10 bad reports said. And because they believed what the 10 said versus the two good report, God said, you know what? Everybody here, you're going to die off before you can go into the wilderness. I mean, before you can go into the land. So they wandered the wilderness for 40 years. So here, here's a nugget. Here's, here's a point. Everybody's opinion is not the right opinion. He only needed two. Not 12. He only needed two. So when we listen to everybody's opinion, everybody's opinion is not the word of God. God told them that you're going to inhabit the land. You're going to take the land. Ten people came back and said, no, nah, I don't think, I don't, we, don't want no, we don't want no problems with them. Like my sons might say, that we don't want no smoke, man. We don't want no smoke with them. <laughs> and you know what? God said, all right, okay, you'll stand in the wilderness for another 40 years. Because they listen to the opinions of others and not the opinions of God. You see, we try to build a reputation based upon the opinions of others and not the opinion of God. That's just a nugget I wanted to drop to you. And, and he says that, the, the, the two spies, when they went into Jericho, they ended up in a prostitute's house. Now, don't ask me how they ended up in a prostitute's house. Um, I, I'm going to just look at that for another sermon. But they ended up in a prostitute's house. And you might say, brother, then how in the world they end up in a prostitute's house? You see, how is it that God, all-knowing, 
when it was time for his children to move to the next level, God, in his all-perfect reputation, used a person with a bad reputation. I want y'all to see that. God used a prostitute in order to get his plan accomplished. You see, God is repetitive in what he does, meaning he uses who he wants to use, not who we think he should use. God does things on his terms, not on our terms. You see, when we want something a certain way and we try to use our own righteousness to get it, more often than not, we fail. That's right. If it was up to me, I would have said, you know what, let's go into this, this, uh, this guy's house who is a, who's a businessman, who can, who can get us the funds that we need, who can get us the back road. And guess what? That guy probably would have gave me up because I wanted to go on my righteousness. But you see, God uses people the way he wants to use them. So it's not up to us to judge a person based upon their reputation. Because when you attach your reputation to God's reputation, then your reputation will be all right. That's right. God used a prostitute to get his job done. That's right. He used a prostitute to help save his, his people so that they could take over the land. You see, too many opinions will get you messed up. Doing things your way will get you messed up. If you align your way with God's way, if you align your reputation, attach that to God's reputation, then your reputation, your, your name is going to be good in the hood. If you do that, your name is going to be good. So let's keep reading verse number two. The Bible says, but someone told the king of Jericho, some Israelites have come here tonight to spy out the land. Let me, let me drop this off to you while I'm there. Somebody told the king, when you start to go execute God's plan, you better believe that the enemy is going to find out. That's right. When you go execute God's plan, when you're going the way he wants you to go, the enemy is going to find out. You see, when, when you're hanging out with your friends and you're doing all the things you shouldn't be doing, it's not a problem. Everybody's good. But the minute you say, you know what, I'm not going to do what you guys are doing. I'm, I'm, I'm going to do it the way God wants me to do. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to go to the club today. I'm going to go to Bible class. They're going to say, bro, what's wrong with you? And then they're going to start messing with you because you're not doing what they want you to do. You see, when you do God's plan and you align yourself with God, the enemy is going to find out. The enemy is going to find out. And guess, guess what else? Keep reading. So the king of Jericho sent orders to Rahab, bring out the men who have come into your house, for they have come here to spy out the land. And we keep reading. Rahab had hidden two men, but she replied, yes, the men were here earlier, but I didn't know where they were from. They lifted, I'm sorry, they left the town at dusk as the gates were about to close. I don't know where they went. If you hurry, you probably can catch up with them. So let's go ahead and skip down. So she sent them off. She gave them a diversion. She sent them out. So let's go ahead and skip down to verse number eight. The Bible says, before the spies went to sleep that night, Rahab went up on the roof to talk with them. And get a look at what she says. She says, I know the Lord have given you this land. Well, how do you know that, Rahab? She told them, we are all afraid of you. Everyone in the land is living in terror, for we have heard how the Lord made a dry path for you through the Red Sea when you left Egypt. And we know what you did in Sion and Og, the two Amorites, uh, what you did to Sion and Og, the two Amorite kings east of the Jordan River, whose people you have completely destroyed. No wonder our hearts have melted in fear. No one has the courage to fight after hearing such things. For the Lord your God is the supreme God of the heavens above and the earth. You see, we're worried about going to the battle when our enemy is even more worried than us. They heard, she heard, she knew before they even got there who they were. She knew who they were. So the question is, you're sending in spies when you can already take the land. See, our enemy is more worried about the battle than we are. Because guess what? He's been ending up on the short end of the stick since the beginning of time. So he already knows the result of the battle. And we're going into the battle fearful. We're going into this thing afraid. And we don't have to be afraid. You see, the enemy knows the God you serve. And is it just by chance that the enemy knows your God a little bit better than you do? Does the enemy know your God a little bit better than you do? Because she knew what was going on. And you see, by her being a prostitute, she is considered an enemy to Israel. You know, that, that wasn't a good way of living. 
That was a, that was a sinful way of living. So she was considered an enemy. But you see, because she knew what God had done for his people, she knew that she needed to align herself with those people. You see, the enemy knows even more than we know sometimes. God has given us every victory that we ever could imagine, and we're still fearful. We're still wondering if we're going to make it through. He woke you up this morning, and you're still wondering why I'm having a bad day because somebody cut me off. Because the enemy knows more about your God that you serve than you do. So we have to think about that sometimes. We can't be caught being less faithful than a person who's not in a relationship with God. You see, I, I deal with that sometimes when I go through struggles and I wonder, I say, man, you know what? I'm, I'm going through this, this hard time. I'm going through this trying time. Uh, I don't know how I'm going to get through. I'm looking down. I'm looking defeated. And a person at work says, you know what, brother? I'm going to pray for you. And I'm the one that has the power of prayer. You see, sometimes the enemy knows your God better than you do. And we have to make sure that we buck up and we attach ourselves to his reputation. Because God is faithful. He is repetitive with what he does, and he has a relationship with us. And when we attach ourselves to his reputation, it's nothing we need to worry about. Because we got a big brother that's going to go fight for us. We got, a, we got an uncle and a cousin and a grandma and them that's going to go take care of business for us. And we're concerned about this little battle. The enemy is more concerned about the battle than we are. We got to act like it. We got to look ourselves in the mirror and wonder if that person knows more, if that person, that person knows more about the God I serve than I do. We got to get it together. I got to get it together. I'm talking about me. I got to get it together. Now listen, God, a relationship with God, It's what we all need in order to make it to the next level. In order to progress through this earth, in order to get to heaven, we need a relationship with God. You see, what Rahab did in, in, in continuing verses, Rahab said, listen, I know you all are going to take this land, but when you do, she didn't say if y'all are going to, she says, when you do, make sure that you remember me and my house That's right. and you save us. Yeah. That's right. So she knew she had to be attached to the relationship of God. Right. And you see, sometimes what we do is we think that Having a relationship with God means that we can just skate through life. We don't have to keep working. We don't have to keep uh, 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 building our, rela- our, 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 uh, I'm sorry, our um, reputation. We don't have to keep being repetitive and consistent with the things that we do. You see, having a relationship with God doesn't mean that trouble is not going to come. Right. Having a relationship with God means that you can deal with the trouble when it comes. We are all subjected to some trials and some tribulations. But having that relationship with God, knowing God's reputation, if we know God's reputation, we know it because we have a relationship with him and we've seen and experienced his repetitiveness. You see, and what the Satan wants to do, Satan wants to beat you down and he wants to make you feel like, you know what, you don't need a relationship with God. He wants you to stop believing in the repetitiveness of God. God wasn't there for you all the time. So when you stop Uh, being close to God, you stop having a relationship with God, then God's reputation falls, and that means that you don't have to be attached to what you don't believe in. That's what the enemy wants to do. Satan wants to do all those things, strip you of all those things, so that you do not believe that God is who he says he is. He wants to make you feel like you don't believe who God says he is. But you see, getting back to the point I just made that trouble doesn't mean that it's not going to come just because you know who God is or you have a relationship with him. That means that you can deal with the trouble. And we all know Job, right? We know the story of Job. We heard that story millions of times. So for those of you who haven't heard it, I'm going to give you a quick version of it. So Job was a man who was righteous before God's eyes. And there was a time where the the, the, the Bible says that the sons of, of God came together. And guess who came walking in that meeting? You know, you know, Satan came walking in that meeting. Because the Bible says Satan's going to and fro, seeking whom he may devour. He even said it to God. God said, man, what you up to? And Satan says, you know, I'm, I'm handling my business, man. I'm about to get somebody. You know, and, and, so, and so God said, have you considered my servant Job? God brought up Job's name. You know why? Because Job had a reputation. He didn't just have a reputation among men. He had a reputation with God. That's why God brought up his name, 
God said, have you considered my servant Job? And see, here's, here's another nugget for you while we're on this, while we're on this topic. He asked Job had he, I'm sorry, he asked Satan had he considered his servant Job. Because guess what? Satan couldn't do anything with Job unless God allowed him to do it. We spend too much time putting Satan on an equal plane with God. Saying Satan is just as powerful. Satan is not just as powerful. God has all power. So we do more by putting Satan on a pedestal than what he even can do and accomplish. Because he couldn't do anything. He can't touch you or do anything with you unless God allows him to do it. So let's remember that. Satan is not as powerful as God. But God said, have you considered my servant Job? And he, you know, Job went through a lot. First, he let him take all of his stuff. Job lost his, his, his livestock, his money. He lost his, some of his land. He lost his children. His friends left him. God even let him keep that nagging wife, who I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure Job said you could take her too. But all of his stuff, and even, even when his stuff was gone, the Bible says that God allowed Satan to touch Job's body. So his health went as well. And you see, Job went through all those things, but he never counted God as faithless. He said that God is still faithful. And, and because of that, God was able to pull Satan. I mean, Satan couldn't do anything with Job. Job did not give in. He never cursed God. And because of that, Job was blessed doubly at the end of all of that trial that he went through. Now, I know he wished he still had his children, but Job was blessed because of his faithfulness. And the question is, how could you remain faithful during those times? Because of God's repetitiveness and his relationship. God had a reputation with Job. Likewise, Job had a reputation with God, and they knew they had been through some stuff together. He knew that God was faithful. So because I've experienced this before, I'm not going to turn my back on God because I know that God is able to take me through anything that I'm going through. Just because you're with God doesn't mean that trouble is not going to come. It just means that you can deal with the trouble when it comes. You see, God trusted Job's reputation. So when you go through things and you're dealing with trouble, you better believe it's God trusting your reputation as well. You see, God gave you that no good family because he knew he trusted you with getting them to Christ. You know, God gave you those no good children, not the Bennett boys, but God gave you <laughs> those no good children because he knew you weren't going to drive down the road and let them out on the side of the street. You see, and God gave you that no good spouse because he knew that you would be willing to forgive them when they made a mistake. That's right. You see, God gives you these things because you have a reputation with him. That's right. So the question is, if you're not going through anything, uh -oh, if you're not dealing with any trials or any struggles, yeah. does God trust you enough to deal with? Come on, That's the question you need to ask yourself. You know what? God ain't giving me this because I, I failed. Well, because you're not going through certain things, it's because he doesn't trust you with it. He allowed everything to be taken from Job, Job's health to be taken from Job, because he trusted Job with his reputation. That's what it was. This was a test of God's reputation. Satan said, you know what? If you let me touch Job, he'll curse you. And God said, you know what? That's my man. He got him. It was a test of God's reputation. So the question is, do we fail when it comes to testing God's reputation. Right. Listen to this. As a coach, I coach football, but as a coach, I make sure that I, I, I recognize the threat on the other team. Right? The other team could have 30 people, but I don't spend my time focusing on all 30 people. Right. I spend my time focusing on what the threat is. On, if I know if we want to win this game, I need to stop this guy. If we want to make sure we get off the field on third down, I got to watch this guy with the ball. Right, yep. So we recognize where the threat is. Same thing Satan does. He recognizes where the threat is. Right. And Satan knows you. God knows you too. All of us have some things that we deal with. We have a besetting sin. Satan knows that. Right. And Satan says, if I want to get him, I know exactly where to get him. I don't need to focus on all three of these things. I need to focus on that thing. So the question is, if you ain't under no attack, he might already have you. He might already felt like he won the game. So when you go through things, don't look at it as, oh, man, I'm going through some things. Look at it as I have another opportunity to prove God's reputation. 
I have another opportunity to show how repetitive God is, how he continues to be faithful, how he continues to bless me. I have another chance to show the relationship that I have with God. That's the way you need to look at your trials and tribulations. And you see, like I said, Satan knows the threat. I think about the story in, in Acts chapter 19. Uh, we're getting ready to close. But Acts chapter 19, when uh, the, the seven sons of a Jewish priest, he saw um, uh, uh, Paul casting out demons. So, you know, during the first century, the apostles had power to cast out demons. They had the same power, not all power like Jesus had, but Jesus, they had the Holy Spirit and they could do things. They could do miracles. Not the stuff Peter Popoff does, but they could do actual <laughs> miracles, right? Well, the Bible says call them out, but it, he could do actual miracles. And one of the things they could do was cast out demons. And see, what they did was the seven sons saw uh, Paul doing that, and they said, you know what, maybe if he's doing it like that, I can do it like that. And, and they said, in the name of Jesus Christ, as preached by Paul, we cast you out. And the demon turned around and, and looked at him. And, and the person who was possessed with the demon, he turned around and looked at him and said, I know Jesus, and I know Paul, but who are you? Right. <laughs> you see, if, if, if Satan ain't trying to get you and he don't know you, that means maybe you, you, you running low on some power. <laughs> if you're not able to do the things that, that God wants you to do, then guess what? You ain't a threat to Satan. So remember that when we go through things, when we're challenged with certain things, it's an opportunity for us to prove God's will, to prove his reputation. So reputi rep sorry, repetition and relationship will not only give you a good rep reputation amongst men, it will give you a good reputation with God. You see, God does things. The Bible says in Psalms, the 23rd Psalms, that he leads you uh, through, through the path of righteousness for his name's sake. You see, God does things for you because his name is on the line. That's right. His reputation is on the line. He says, if you're faithful to me and you put your hand in my hand, then I will bless you. So guess what? He's going to have to bless you because his name is on the line. That's right. His reputation is on the line. And when we attach ourselves to his reputation, then that means that our reputation is good as well. Yeah. You see, repetition and relationship will not only give you a good reputation amongst men, but it'll give you a good reputation with God. So, listen, church. We have to get past the superficial, and we have to get to the substantive. That's right. We got to get past thinking that we can just skate through this life by not being serious about our relationships with God and our relationships with people. Come on, preacher. You got to ask yourself this question. What is my reputation amongst men? And then ask yourself this next question, what is my reputation to God? You see, is my reputation amongst men that I am not repetitive and I don't have a relationship? You see, when it comes to evangelizing people, we got to do some things and be consistent about doing those things. That's right. We got to do some things that establish relationships with people. That's right. We have to be consistent and we have to be connected. Come on, that is how you establish a good reputation. Not a false reputation, but a good rep, rep, uh, uh, but a good reputation. See, I'm getting myself all twisted, but I'm, good thing I wrote it down. Amen. So God's reputation with us is built on a rep, repetition mm -hmm. and relationship. Come on, preacher. That's what his reputation is built on. We know that God is faithful because we've experienced him being faithful. Amen. We know that God is faithful because he does it over and over, time and time again. He has a relationship with us. So we have to be the same way amongst ourselves, with the community, and to God. We got to keep that relationship with God. We got to be repetitive about doing the things that we do that are right, being consistent. And if you're not a member of the church, first thing you got to do is establish a relationship with God. That's the first thing you have to do. Because guess what? It's, it's a little hot in here, but it's even hotter outside, if y'all get what I'm saying. It gets, it gets hot sometimes, but even outside, it gets even hotter. Right. Imagine, you know, when we're dealing with things now, we have hope. That's Imagine right. dealing with things with no hope. Yeah. Right. You see, it, it, sometimes it gets hot in the church, but it's even hotter outside. That's right, preacher. That's so we have to make sure that we get the relationship right with God first. And we get that right by first hearing the word. You got to hear the preached word of God. 
Bible says, Romans 10, 17, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Many people say, you know what, I have faith. But what is your faith built on? What have you heard? What have you obeyed? You have to have the faith that you can read about in the Bible. You have to believe that God is, that he is who he said he is, that Jesus Christ came to the earth, died on the cross for our sins, and was raised on the third day. You have to repent of your sins. You got to repent of your sins. You got to change what you're doing. Would you, would you loan a person money who consistently loses money? They're investing poorly, and they come to you and say, listen, man, I need a, a $10,000 loan. And I want to show you my investment portfolio. And they haven't changed not one thing that they did from when they lost a million dollars. You going to give them that money? Because they haven't made any changes. Same thing. You want salvation, you got to change what you're doing. You want forgiveness of sin, you got to stop sinning. Now, that's not going to mean that you're going to be perfect, but you have to strive to be. You see, we all make mistakes, but the blood of Jesus cleanses us daily. But you got to come into contact with the blood of Jesus first. See, you got to believe, repent, confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and be willing to be baptized in the watery graves of baptism for the remission of your sins. Amen. Church, we got to continue to build our reputation, build our reputation on being repetitive and having a relationship. And a relationship with Jesus Christ is something that no money could buy. We got to want that. We got to strive for that. We got to keep holding on to that church. And if there's any in the audience who wants to come and give their life to the Lord, if there's any who want to come forward and who wants to uh, ask for prayers, the time to do that is now as we stand and as we sing. Amen. Amen.